it's foreign in dentistry to know what to do with the occlusion after surgery. Yeah. Okay. Interestingly, we have lots of things we do to the occlusion with mechanically damaged TMJs. Yeah. But, but it's relatively poor understanding of what to do with the occlusion after the TMJs have been fixed. Yeah, see, uh, that's an interesting question because, so let's say you've repaired, you've surgerized both joints. Um, would you want an anterior guidance or would you want a group function? It depends on the surgery. Mm -hmm. So here, here's what anterior guidance is designed to fit with relative to the joint. Anterior guidance fits with a normal disc. Okay? Right. And anterior guidance is not necessarily a fit with an injured TMJ. Okay? So if you took a patient never treated, okay, they were never treated, and let's say they started out with normal joint foundations, Typically, that patient uh, with normal discs, normal foundation, they have guidance. They have anterior guidance. And for the patients listening, all that means is that when you move from your back teeth and push your jaw forward or sideways, you feel just your front teeth touching. Okay, that's anterior guidance. And that's the typical pattern that you see with a normal disc. Now, it may be that in some people there's a slight movement horizontally first before they hit those front teeth, sure. okay? And so that's a nuance as to where it begins, okay? When the discs dislocate, typically you're gonna see less anterior guidance. And what that means is that the distance the jaw moves until they touch their front teeth gets greater. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one option. Or the other option is that over time, uh, they wear their back teeth in a way that they're keeping more back teeth in contact more of the time. Okay, if you took it to the extreme, it would be the patient we talked about earlier with totally flat teeth and, you know, wherever they move, they've got lots of teeth touching. So anyway, from, from, the, from the technical side of things, joint damage typically results in more posterior interferences. Right. Okay. Now the question is, are those interferences now the enemy or are they the friend? Depends on your perspective. Right. So teeth in premature contact get sore, okay? So from that standpoint, that type of bite could be harmful at the tooth level. Could create more injury to the dental pulp or more, more swelling or whatever. But for the joint, it's technically protective, okay? And here is the pearl to understand about the TMJ. Contact on the front teeth equals the pressure that we put on our front teeth equals the pressure we're putting on the joint. Right. Okay. If we put pressure on the front teeth and there's also pressure on the back teeth, now relatively speaking, there's less pressure on the TMJ. Okay. TMJs that have a normal disc, they can take all the pressure you want to put on them. Yeah. TMJs that don't have a normal disc take Limited. less pressure. Okay, so in, in the surgery population where you do a fat graft, uh, the fat graft you can usually get anterior guidance. But what you're going to find is that there's more time on the back teeth with sideways and protrusive movements. And so I simply keep group function. On, on fat graft patients? On fat graft patients I keep them in group function and I have extrapolated group function to the patient who's totally off their disc, right. never reconstructed and on retrodiscal tissues. Okay. So I want to protect the retrodiscal tissue the same way I protect the fat. How about the disc repair patient? The disc repair patient, I have no problem with immediate anterior guidance because they're repaired. Got it. 
and so you can have immediate anterior guidance and posterior disclusion and I'm not worried about them at all. What would you do um, with a total joint bilateral? Well total joint is there's so much variability on the mechanical components yeah. and so for example if the eminence is flatter uh, it's going to be more challenging for that patient one. anterior guidance. <laughs> yeah. uh, probably the most reasonable thing is to try to protect the teeth. Yeah. Okay, so you may have some group function, kind of a balanced group function, in other words. Sure. Where you don't have one tooth really heavily traumatized. Were you like you'd set up a denture back in the day when we were in school learning how to. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and here's the reason why. This is not talked about. Uh, from the time you put in a man-made structure, okay, or substitute for the body, that begins a process of wear, okay? So Break even down. a crown, you know, it's going to start the process of wear. It mechanically is in its best shape the day it goes in. Mm -hmm. So if we set up the TMJ to take more load on the surface of that, of that joint replacement, that's going to increase the wear load. So you can, by giving the patient more group function in the occlusion, you're technically decreasing the amount of loading of the components. Right. Okay. So group function should be more protective. Uh, to the total joint replacement. Now there's research out there that states that um, going to group function on that patient would be a negative because it increases uh, muscle firing, excessive friction on back teeth. Well, I'm not so sure uh, yeah. because with fat graft patients we have broken all the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are two, there are two fallacies what I would call fallacies in dentistry that I've totally broken the rules on. Okay, one is that, that if you do not eliminate them from contact on their back teeth, they're going to trigger reflex spasm in the muscles of mastication. Mm. You know how I turn those off? Sympathetic. Sympathetic nerve block. So I don't buy into that. The second, and this is a little nuance on surgery, there is a concept that it's the retrodiscal tissue that hurts because when the disc is dislocated, the retrodiscal tissue has too much pressure and it ends up in pain. What I've actually found is that in some patients, I can just take the disc out when I'm doing a fat graft, yeah. but I can keep the retrodiscal tissue and cover the bone with it. So they end up with fat and retrodiscal tissue covering the bone the disc that's dislodged down here in the muscle is taken out. Mm -hmm. They do not have pain related to the retrodiscal tissue. There is no difference. So the retrodiscal is causing pain is basically a dogmatic approach. You've seen that, that is really? that is theoretical. I don't know if we could call it dogmatic. It's a theory yeah. that doesn't prove to be true in the fat graft patient. That's fair. Okay. So. Um, at any rate, you, you know, it, it just it just illustrates that there are a lot of things we think are appropriate and with all good intentions, you know, we follow what, what our leaders have told us and and you know, you don't want to stray too far from from how dentistry evolves. But in my opinion, dentistry is way behind in terms of sympathetic pain. Yeah. Dentistry is way behind, too, in understanding all of the mechanisms of muscle spasm, okay? We need to expand our universe beyond just the trigeminal system into the sympathetics, too.